I'm going to I'm going to make my way through this sermon with some relative speed if I can cuz we we have spent some good time already and I I I feel uh like I want to respect our our time today. Uh so turn with me in in your Bibles to Psalms 137. Uh this is uh the text that grounds the strange land uh, lament and response for our service today that I believe has been a blessing for me uh, many seasons in my life. And uh, I, I was sitting there thinking about uh, our church and all of the many people who are directly impacted by these issues uh, as soon as about 8.30, 9 p.m. on Tuesday hit and it was becoming obvious that the country was getting ready to to make a pretty radical shift. Uh, I had people's mind or people's faces and situations just springing up in my spirit all across the country. And this this passage dropped in my heart and I knew that this was what I needed not only to encourage myself but hopefully lift up as an encouragement to all of us. Uh, Psalms 137 Verse number one, uh, we'll read uh, in the interest of time uh, all the way, uh, well, there ain't numbers, eight eight verses, so we'll read it all, all right? Uh, Verse number one, I'm reading, I believe, from the NIV version, or I don't know which version this is. This is the NIV? Oh, look at God. All right, yeah, that's up there. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Alongside Babylon's rivers, we sat on the banks and we cried and cried, remembering the good old days in Zion. Alongside the quaking aspens, we stacked our unplayed harps, for that's where our captors demanded songs, sarcastically and mockingly, saying, sing us a happy Zion song. But oh, how could we ever sing God's song in this strange or foreign land. Verse number four continues, if I ever forget you, Jerusalem, let my fingers wither and fall off like leaves. Let my tongue swell and turn black if I fall, if I fail to remember you. If I fail, oh dear Jerusalem, to honor you as my greatest. God, remember those Edomites, which were the enemies of Israel and Jerusalem. God, remember those Edomites and remember the ruin of Jerusalem. That day they yelled out, wreck it, smash it to bits. And you Babylonians, ravagers, may there be a reward to whoever gets back at you for all you've done to us. Yes, a reward to the one who grabs your babies and smashes their heads on the rocks. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Now, uh, just real quick, tell your neighbor, we're going to get through the strange land. Tell them that we're going to get through the strange land. This text is such an important text in my mind because often we, as followers of Jesus, are often taught or asked to ignore our human emotions and move quickly to a God is going to take care of everything. And I often believe that, you know, that is not really what's up for debate in my life. Amen. I'm very clear God's going to take care of everything Um, because God's always taking care of everything. Um, I am often wondering what is it about me and us that, cause us to not lean in and take care of what God has left in our charge to do. Often when challenges and trials come, if we keep it real, God and God's request in our lives, God's ask for us to be stewards, to be active participants in the creation of the world that God had in God's imagination when God created everything and it was good, like all good, when you and I can look around at the world and the world is not all good, then you and I better appreciate that it is our responsibility given to us by God to make every effort 
to make sure that the world, through our work as the church, becomes better. Now, it's important to keep appreciating that unless we think God is big enough to deal with these issues, then we will often find ourselves not just in the immediate response, challenged and filled with all kinds of conflicting emotions, but I would argue that once the immediate shock wears off, some of us can stay stuck in that rut when we don't quickly allow ourselves to reset and be reminded that there's some work, divine work, that we are being called and asked to do. J.B. Phillips, he's a writer, he says that the trouble with many people today is that they have not found a God big enough for modern needs. So while their experience of life has grown in a score of different directions and their emotional horizons have been expanded to the point of bewilderment by world events or scientific discoveries, their ideas of God have remained particularly static, stale, and small. And I found myself this week looking at the ominous events not just with the election, but I have a certain kind of focus on the trial of Officer Tenzing in Cincinnati who killed Sam DeBose, caught on video at a traffic stop and shot him in the head on video and found out last night that the jury was a hung jury. And another officer is walking away so it seems, without accountability, I was aware that we lost a few more young folk to violence in this area. Certainly have felt all kinds of terrible emotions and even thoughts when I saw the number of young people in schools across the country being terrorized by folk who feel like the election of Donald Trump has given them a certain freedom to speak and act in ways that diminish the humanity of other people. There were moments where I was saying, man, God, where is you? And then I was reminded that God is big enough to sustain not only me and us during these seasons and moments. But God is never surprised. Now, we may be surprised. And you should be surprised. Because none of us can tell the future. But I do believe that there is a really important opportunity for us to keep imagining what does it mean to serve a big God? A God that does not find God's self caught unaware, not just of the things that happen, but the grief you and I feel when things happen. I mean, God, for me, in this moment, is big enough to hold my disappointment, to hold my doubt, to assuage my anger, to help me find words to soothe the pain and the vulnerability of many who are now left vulnerable in a very public way to the evil machinations of other citizens and, dare I say, the continued dehumanization and oppression of our government. One must ask ourselves, what does it mean then for us to engage in certain practices that allow us to find our grounding not in the events that happen, but in the God who can sustain us through these seasons? Now, part of what I believe the biblical text is powerful as a gift this morning for us is that it helps us to appreciate, number one, we're not the first group of people 
in human history to ask God some hard questions. And guess what? Humanity still, you know, went on. So God didn't wipe human beings off the earth because we was asking God some questions. Touch your neighbor, somebody. As a matter of fact, if you read this text, you take it seriously. God didn't even, uh, uh, God gave us an opportunity to see the, the inner workings of human anguish. Because for all the folks saying that we should just forgive, 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 this text I read, which is a lament and a prayer, is actually calling for the enemies of Israel's, uh, uh, the, enemy of, the enemies of Israel to suffer the same consequences that they have enacted upon them. Now, I got to tell you that it is so important for you and I to appreciate that there is a lot of room that God seems to give all of us to be human, to process through our human emotions. There seems to be a comfortability with God, the one who created us, where God does not seek to have us jump from anger, anguish, disappointment, and disillusionment to a place of clarity overnight. That if God is a God who lives in time and outside of time, how many of you know God don't have no timetable? Hello, somebody. All of it for God is happening pretty much all at the same time. So for you and I, we're the ones struggling with time. (laughs) Amen. Now, two years, four years, six years, eight years, that seemed like a long time. But how many of you know sometimes time can go by real fast, as they say when you're having fun? And time can move real slow. My daughters, you know, when they get on time out, you know, they ask me, Daddy, is it time yet? I'm like, no. 30 more seconds. Daddy, is it time yet? No. I said, you're going to learn how to read a clock today. Because when I said a two-hour timeout, I meant a two-no, two-hour timeout. <laughs> time can go by fast or time can go by slow. But the question for many of us is not about time, it's about what are we gonna do in between. What are we going to do with the faith that we have and the reality that we face and the tools that have been given to us. In this moment and in this season, I want to submit to you that you and I are in a strange land, but we've been in a strange land for a pretty long time. I mean, you know, it is not to diminish the ominous looming threat that is a great possibility. But how many of you know uh, the issues of police brutality are not because of Donald Trump? The two million or so folks who've been deported in the last eight years are not because of Donald Trump. The sickness in your body and the breaking up of your family is not because of Donald Trump. The unfunded schools and the explosion of jails and the cancer and all these issues that we face don't have much to do with Donald Trump at all. So you and I have to make sure that we don't give Donald Trump too much credit. (laughs) Uh, I mean, uh, he can get a little bit, praise God. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. But he can't get the credit for the fallen world, the human weakness, the sin that is exploded with, with, with very little, you know, regret, corrective measures by even those who claim to be our allies and our friends. 
Part of what I want you to appreciate, my brothers and sisters and loved ones today, is that the way we make it through the strange land is to remember that it is in the strange land we may find some direction to help us move with a sense of renewed purpose and focus and maybe even get a little bit more in touch with our own complicity at times in allowing some of these conditions to persist. Part of what I want you to appreciate as we go through this lament is that when we make our cry of distress, it is always rooted in a situation of crisis and despair. So in the Old Testament, the lament is regarded as inevitably part of what happens between God and humanity. Some say, how can you be so upset and angry with God or even in this moment? It's because I expect something different when I place my hope in that which I believe has my best interest at heart. But the writer of the book of Psalms wants to give you and I fair warning that things aren't always going to be peachy and cream. It ain't always going to be the uh, uh, outcome that that will make us have this warm feeling on the inside, because when you examine what a lament is, it gives you and I the opportunity to see that even though I may feel trouble right now, trouble don't last always. But I'm not going to ignore the trouble. I'm not going to ignore the trouble that is staring us in the face. No, part of what you and I have to do if we're going to get through this moment is a few things. The first thing I want to say is that we must name the problem. Somebody holler, name the problem. Now, verse number seven in this text, it is very clear. It says, remember the ruin of Jerusalem the day they yelled out, wreck it, smash it to bits. One of the worst things that we can do as a church in this moment is be too, listen, hyper-spiritual or too ahistorical. The danger of being hyper-spiritual is that we dehumanize those who are suffering and become complicit in their suffering if all we have to say to folks is just pray and believe God is in control. Let me tell you something. I'm not saying you shouldn't pray, but... But, but understand that if prayer is your only response in the face of the death and the, the, the hurt of your brother, your sister, or your loved one, then your prayer is inadequate. Hello, somebody. Because the scriptures say we should pray without ceasing. So you should always be praying. You shouldn't be waiting for no trouble to come for you to start praying. You ought to tell your neighbor, I pray all the time. I'm not talking about you telling me to do something I'm already doing. Wish I could talk to somebody. Does not Romans 12 say to present your whole body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship, which means that every day you wake up, your life should be an act of prayer. An act of worship, not just when trouble comes, but I'm waking up every day and everything I do, I'm praying. Every step I take, I'm worshiping. Why? Because I'm doing what God has called me to do. So prayer, your discipline of prayer can't be separated from action. Our prayer should embolden us direct us, sustain us as we present our lives as a sacrificial act of God in the world. And I also agree that God is on the throne and God is in control. That's not the question. The question is, what are you in control of? With God in the Genesis narrative placed the the first family in the garden, we're told that they were given what? Authority and dominion to be stewards of everything that God created. God is in control, and because God is in control, God said, I'm going to use my control and give you some control. Hello, somebody. God says, I'm going to give you some power. I'm going to give you something to do. So the question is, what are you and I doing with our control? God gave you power. God gave me agency. 
There's so much more authority and power we have within our reach. So save the platitudes and the cliches. If they sideline you from stewardship or responsibilities. Can you name the problem of racism, white supremacy, sexism, misogyny, violence, and oppression? If we can't name those problems because our eyes are so heavenly focused, our ears are so clogged with religiosity, our mouths are so filtered, you know, with the Christi Christianese. Hello, somebody. That we can't name the suffering around us. You ain't going to make it through the strange land. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I got to name some stuff. I got to name some stuff. Now, now, it's important to appreciate, too, we can't be ahistorical about what's going on. Being ahistorical will contribute to us having the wrong analysis, which will keep us in the strange land much longer than we are called to be there. Verse number seven, they say, can we remember the ruin of Jerusalem? What is it about our memory as citizens of the United States of America that we don't have memory? We don't remember the cyclical nature of oppression, systemic oppression in this country. William Barber calls it that we're now in the third reconstruction. Pastor William Barber, one of our, our good, good preacher friends is going to come here soon. We, we, don't, we don't remember that we're in the third reconstruction and, and, and how if you read history, every time perceived gains of Human rights, universal God-given rights were won by oppressed peoples. The system of white supremacy and white nationalism, what Van Jones on CNN called white lash, has always struck back. It did it after the end of the Civil War. First Reconstruction. There was an explosion of agency by descendants of African slaves. They burned down Wall Street, Black Wall Street. They enacted these laws and codes that criminalized the movement of descendants of African slaves in the South. And then they instituted Jim Crow laws. And once the resistance of that hit enough of a crescendo to break the legal back of that, there was the explosion of more violence, lynchings, Ku Klux Klan. Because we don't have a memory, we looking around and we trying to figure out, oh my goodness, what's going on? Well, part of why you and I need to have a memory is so we can look back and see what did the faithful do then? How can we learn? And lest you think these folk weren't Christians, understand. There was a reason why they were bombing their churches. There was a reason why they were, they were assassinating preachers and mothers of churches and, 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 and these folk on their way to Sunday school. So this is the struggle of the church in the world. And part of what you and I have to appreciate is that we got some problems even within our own church that we got to pay attention to. Because if 20% of the black male voters voted for such an agenda and 30% of our Latino brothers and sisters and loved ones embrace policies that will put their families in peril and 81% of white evangelicals voted in record numbers in such a way that it's literally opened up a portent of hell and unleashed white vigilantism in an unprecedented manner, we got some problems in the church that we got to address ourselves. You and I have to be able, as followers of Jesus in this moment, 
to not be ahistorical, but appreciate that what we need from the church in this moment is not just praying, not just preaching, not just singing, but we need a prophetic word that will challenge the way people are following Jesus in this moment. There's a theological conversation that we have to have. And it's important to have the right language. And some of that language is not going to be birthed in the American empire. Because too many of us are drunk and swimming in this water and we can't even talk right. That's why I like to look outside of American Christianity and see what does, Amer- what does, what does the followers of Jesus in other places have to say about the way we're following Jesus here. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm enthralled by this new uh, uh, sister. She's a German liberation theologian. Her name is Dorothy Sole. And she called the kind of political Christianity we're seeing in America as Christofascism. Ooh, that's what I said. It is a Christianity that individualizes and sentimentalizes Jesus. A Christianity that severs Jesus' connection to the Hebrew prophets and makes a mockery of his ministry and mission to the poor and the marginalized. The Christo-fascist is one who has a God without justice and a Jesus without the cross. An Easter without a cross. One that remains metaphysical in such a way that we might as well bring the Easter bunny back and put it in the center of our celebration rather than the crucified and risen Savior. And if you and I are going to get out of the strange land, we got to make sure we're following the Jesus that wants to take us out of the strange land and not keep us locked up in this situation That will have us dizzy, dazed, and confused. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him, you better name that problem. You better name that problem. So so a a reflection question, how does prayer and scripture and fellowship with suffering believers help you describe the problem? If you stand by yourself with your own analysis... If black folk got their analysis and white folk got their analysis and Latino folk got their analysis and Asian folk got their analysis and indigenous folk got their analysis and agnostics got their analysis and Republicans got their analysis and Democrats got their analysis and never the analysis shall meet, we going to stay in a strange land. But I'm here to tell you there is a word from God that can bust up all your analysis. And help you and I to recover the shared humanity and responsibility we have to take care of this earth and everyone who lives inside of it. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them you better name that problem. The second thing, if we're going to get out of the strange land, listen, you can't fall into despair. Somebody holler, don't fall into despair. The scripture says we sat on the river banks of Babylon and we cried and we cried. Now, I'm all about the crying. Believe that. We've been going through this series on Sawubona, right? And we've been talking about how we put on a burden of strength, particularly our sisters. And that strength is often silencing the emotions that you and I have been created to have. We talk about how men carry around a a toxicity in a way that helps us be more disposed to violence against ourselves and against our loved ones. Because too often we got so many emotions that we don't know how to express that stuff. So the only time it comes out is when Mount Vesuvius explodes. So I'm not telling you not to cry and not to emote, but I am telling you you better not fall into despair. Because for the follower of God, listen, our grief will always have a shelf life. We will cry. We will mourn. But if we stay in a posture of mourning too long, without proper self-care, we will fall into despair. Does not the scripture says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy. Comes in the morning. Now, again, 
The reason why I'm weeping is because I'm surrounded by so many people who are being harmed. So I'm not just going to walk around here joyful while somebody getting their head cracked in. I'm not going to walk around here feeling joyful and happy and celebratory while they're carrying our brothers and sisters into prisons and deportation centers. While my Muslim brothers and sisters are being harassed and no one's coming to their aid. There's nothing to be happy about in there. But let me tell you what's at risk if we fall into despair. There is a language of despair that can overtake us and change the way we see the world. I was, I was so enamored, I went and saw Arrival. You know, I'm a big science fiction person. That movie was pretty good, praise God, even for all you non-science fiction folk. And they were trying to communicate with these new aliens that had just arrived. And it took them a long time to figure it all out. But part of the dialogue in the movie was with this linguist who was trying to learn the language of the alien species. And it reminded me of my seminary courses at Duke where we started to talk about how when you learn a new language, it changes your brain structure. Y'all stay with me for a while. That learning a foreign language will often open up parts of you that have never been opened before. That it researches shows that when you learn a language, your brain physically, structurally changes and your perception shifts. And that you'll create more neural pathways in your brain that lead to noticeable changes. The left hemisphere that is generally believed to be the logical part of the brain where language skills originate, that stuff will get more thick. So you'll be able to make all these different kind of connections that you never thought were possible. Learning a new language, it doesn't just change the makeup of your brain, but the theory known as linguistic relativity tells us that it also will help change the way you see the world. That when you learn some languages that are different than yours because they have more nuance at times, you will then be able to see a different kind of nuance. Because they describe things differently, they allow you and I to have a different way of seeing that which we always thought we understood. If we are given to despair and the language of despair, don't you see how despair can change your mind and your eyes and your vision and your actions away from the faithfulness of what God is calling us to do in loving one another and make us act in ways that are only indicative of despair. That when you become totally seduced by despair, it's harder to love the unlovable. When you become seduced and overrun by despair, it's more difficult to make peace with your enemies. When you become overdetermined by despair, it is impossible to hear the voice of God. My brothers and sisters, what's at stake right now is not a presidency. What's at stake right now is can the people of God stay the course on the mission that we're called to do in the world? Because I'm here to tell you, racism was here the day before he was elected. Huh. Violence was here the day before Obama was elected. How many of you know poverty was here before Bush was elected? That you and I got an assignment and despair can't be the thing that becomes our new language. No, I will not use my tongue to speak in despair because death and life are in the power of my tongue. I'm going to speak life. And I'm going to make sure 
that in this moment, even if I have to cry and even if I have to weep and mourn, I'm going to keep going back to the rivers where I know life is. Uh, how many of you know that sometimes you need to hang out by the rivers of Babylon? Because by the rivers of Babylon, there's always some water. Uh, somebody say water is life. Uh, Lord, have mercy. Uh, how many of you know sometimes you got to get close to some rushing water? That can clean your feet and that 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 can give you uh, some peace and some serenity. I don't know about you, but it was by the rivers of Babylon where I realized I had some power I didn't know I had before. It was at the rivers of Babylon while I was weeping that I found a strength that I didn't know was even available to me before. It's easy to talk about what you can do when you don't think you have uh, uh, any adversaries or when you think you got it all figured out. But how many of you know sometimes a curveball will let us be reminded that at the end of the day, I need to look up to God. I need to look up to the one who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we could ask or think. Uh, give your neighbor a high five and tell him, go back to the waters. Uh, you ought to go back to the waters and ask God, God, what would you have me to learn right here at the water? Uh, because even though I had to cry at the water, uh, even though the problem put me at the water bank, uh, I can be honest and say that problem is helping me right about now. That problem is helping me to keep my eyes focused on God. That problem is helping me to bend my knees in prayer. That problem is helping me to take some self-inventory about what I need to do that I've not done before. I know that it's easy to love those who look like me. It's easy to ride with those who agree with me. But how many of you know that's not what God told us to do. God said you got to get in with the suffering. You got to align with the oppressed. You got to throw in your lot with those that have no voice. Because if you can do that, you'll see the power of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. And then the last thing the scripture says uh, is that you ought to pick up your harp. Somebody say, pick up your harp. Uh, the Bible says that they hung their harps on the trees uh, and they left their harps there unplayed. Uh, how many of you know some of us have taken our tools uh, and we've hung them up on a tree uh, because we're disappointed, uh, because we feel let down, uh, because we think we are forsaken. Uh, but I hear God say, uh, pick up your harp. Uh, Get your tool in your hand. It's time to go to work. Pick up your harp and get what I need you to do. Don't you know that God gave you a harp? God gave you a gift. God gave you a tool that nobody else has. God gave you a gift that can break the bonds of oppression. God gave you a tool that will pull every cover off of the evil in the world. God gave you a voice that if you lift up your voice in the marketplace, on the school grounds, in the neighborhoods, in the government, that God will use your gift. God will use your tool. God will use your harp. And victory shall be ours. Shout yeah! My brother and sister, what do I want you to know today? That we will get through the strange land. It may not be today, and it may not be tomorrow, but I am convinced that God will bring us through. God will bring us out. Victory is on the way. Hope is here. Help has arrived, and it's you, it's you, it's us. Somebody shout hallelujah. 
let me say it to you. You got to understand that we may be hard pressed, but we're not in despair. We are not forsaken because God is with you. 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 Need a stellar gift for your stellar wife? Best Buy's Blue Shirts make it easy with this two-in-one laptop that delivers a one-two punch of Windows 10 performance powered by 7th Gen Intel Core processors. Why, if we made the holidays any easier, point set. So cry. Just make sure you're crying in the right place. Cry in a place that will get you life back. Folk, all, you know, all our movement, we got all these sayings, get your life. I mean, you know, getting your life will often happen by the rivers. Most of us think that your life can only happen when you win it. But don't we serve the resurrected I mean, understand what it means to serve a resurrected Jesus. That in order for us to get to victory, we may have to suffer apparent defeat. But is not that what those before us have had to endure? Why did we become so special that the Weakness and arrogance of these political elites. The anger and malice of these nationalists and terrorists. Domestic terrorists. We thought we were going to escape that. While they're falling down, we got new leaders raising up. Huh? While this church of apostasy is losing its credibility we got another faithful church rising up I know it hurts when things have to die especially when you've been placing too much hope in that thing maybe some of this has to happen so we we'll remember that our hope is not built on a political party, on the color of my skin, on how much money's in my bank account. Our hope is built in the creator who gave us all the same dignity, worth, and value. And as long as we can be reminded of that, the strange land is a pit stop. It's a pit stop. So for some of us, it's a schedule appointment. Hello, somebody. Because, you know, when you get educated like me, get a little bit of money, you start to smell yourself. Thinking that, hmm, man, I'm, I'm all right. And then life happens. And you fall right back apart, and you become the pre-educated, pre-elite, pre-wealthy. You know, the one that has snot running out your mouth, out your nose. Because ah! you didn't know nothing else to do. You know, when you didn't have nothing, you didn't know nothing else to do but just holler. You didn't know you was hollering at God. You was like, Jesus! You don't even believe in Jesus, but that's the first thing that come out your mouth. Hello, somebody. But then we get our little tinkets and trinkets. We start turning to my degree from Duke. Well, what did, what, hmm, my, what, we start turning to the, the commentators and, and, and our nonprofits and, and, and Pookie and Ray Ray and our boo. And we take all their advice. And we look around and we still in a strange land. See God first. Let's keep our eyes focused on our work. God's work in the world. 
We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, systems of evil in high places. But don't get me wrong. Those systems inflict pain, violence, and death. So I may not be wrestling with that flesh and blood, but I will be resisting it. This is how we make it through the strange land. There is no timetable for making it through the strange land. You get out the strange land when you're not in the strange land no more. When you start looking around and be like, yeah, this is, this is, this is back to normal. This is a place of equilibrium, a place of life, a place of faith, a place of strength and stability. My people, we will come out of this strange land. I pray your prayer today is that we'll come out of it quicker. Because we got some work to do. Come on, stand with me, everybody. Grab the hand of the person next to you.